That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Medusa Deluxe, the directorial debut of Thomas Hardiman, which premiered at the 2022 Locarno Film Festival, so uh, exactly a year ago. It's being released uh, courtesy of A24 on August 11th, 2023. I'm going to read the premise. A murder mystery set in a competitive hairdressing contest. Extravagance and excess collide as the death of a contestant sows seeds of division in a community whose passion for hair verges on obsession. I'm going to read my poll quote. Reading the premise, I thought this would be a wild ride. While it does have some interesting components, I was ultimately left feeling this recipe needs a lot more seasoning. What's yours? Oh, good. Uh, a whodunit hair don't, a verbosity needing a bit more fabulosity. Reading the premise, uh, the, the, the movie poster got me, and then reading the premise, I'm like, oh, this is exactly the kind of film I want to see. Same. And they had some uh, misleading pull quotes from other critics on the poster, including, I think, is it, is it, is it Screen Daily, who compares this to like, Echoes of El Motivar and Peter Greenaway? I mean... Well, or one pull quote was like the funniest film of the year. There are things I did like about this movie, but just reading the premise, I don't feel like it's a murder mystery. We're going to get into it, but like there's no detective trying to figure out anything and the people who are involved don't really seem to be interested in figuring out what happened. Yes. It doesn't feel extravagant at all. Or excessive. Or excessive. I, I mean, when you're talking about Peter Almodovar, which I'm guessing because you kind of have a... a flamboyant queer character yeah. that's factored in that. I don't know if that got netted that Almodovar reference, but Peter Greenaway is often bombastic. I don't know if we're talking about early Greenaway, like Drowning by Numbers, but he always prized style over substance, arguably, and and maybe Hardiman is doing that, and I don't know if that's where that reference comes from, but it, this is no nowhere near Peter Greenaway. Film. Well, continuing, like, seeing these characters and their passion for hair, I mean, there's one character who seems, I mean, there's one character who's actively doing hair in the movie, who I feel like is passionate about her craft, and then the humor, I don't think I laughed one time. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I would call this a drama. Yeah, yes, a, a kind of a dry draw. You know what this feels like? This feels like if Mike Lee decided to commandeer something like Drop Dead Gorgeous. That's what, that, this, that's what this feels like. Okay, so the story. They, we're at this hairdressing contest, but we're like backstage, like people preparing. But we see when we start the film, we already... It has already happened that one of the contestants was found dead and scalped. Like, his scalp is missing. But we focus on some of the contestants and the models talking about this person, but also gossiping about other things and seeming to be more concerned about completing the contest instead of worrying about the fact that someone may have been murdered at this event. And another important aspect of the film is that it's supposed to look like it was all one shot. Mm -hmm. So it feels like I do like the way the film looks. It was, yeah, it, it, it's shot by Robbie Ryan, who uh, was Oscar nominated for The Favorite. You also know his work in uh, Marriage Story. Uh, Amer oh. American Honey is also a good one. So yeah, I, I like the look of it, but it, it feels a little bit like Gaspar Noe's climax in the look. Well, and so in the look. we should talk about that too. But yeah, so it feels like we're kind of in the room with the people. We never, we only see the stage that the contest might have happened on once. But for the first hour, 30 minutes, we're just in like the back rooms and hallways and we're just kind of walking back and forth. There's lots of talking, which I like, but I don't think they're saying anything that interesting. <laughs> they're not. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I think there are interesting elements in the script that, that, that Hardiman is playing with, like a mixture of Christian and Greek uh, mythology and, and and themes, but what that leads to, because we're we we're tied down to the look of the film, is that in the dialogue to get those themes across, people are talking about things that sometimes seem inane, if not just dull, that we're supposed to kind of mine through as the film goes along. The opening shot was promising because we get like a battle that's occurring in like what looks like a desert, but then there are like hairdresser accoutrement like like large curling irons or rollers, things like that, and people battling. And then as the camera or the shot pulls out, it, it, it appears that we were looking inside of a hairbrush, mm -hmm. like a wet brush. 
I thought that was really interesting. But even like I listened to the director talk about the film and like in a YouTube video I watched and I just don't see a lot of what he was saying in the film. So the person who was uh, found dead, his name is Mosca. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we find out that he and his partner, this guy named Angel. Uh, they keep saying on hell. Mm -hmm. They were having financial issues, so they started dealing drugs. The only actually there was one part where I giggled because we find out that they're not selling like Molly and cocaine or whatever. They're selling Propecia, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is used for like hair regrowth. So they were making a lot of money off of that. And they talk about how like hair is so important to people. They is in on hell because Mosca's already dead. But where things get tricky is Anhol explains that they got into cahoots with this guy named Patrizio. Mm -hmm. And he sort of turned their little drug dealing ring into selling more like street drugs. So like maybe like Molly and meth or whatever. So we think that maybe Mosca's death is related, like a drug related thing. But just to spoil the ending, we find out that Mosca died because his health was not great. We're told he had diabetes, probably had other underlying conditions, and the combination of his underlying medical conditions and him using these street drugs caused him to just pass out and die. But the reason he was scalped is because at this hairdressing contest, there's a security guard named Gak. Mm -hmm. And Mosca, the dead guy, hit on Gak. And like, they spent the night together. So initially I'm like, oh my gosh, is this a gay panic situation? No. Gak became obsessed with Mosca. Mm -hmm. So the next day he shows up looking for him like while Mosca's preparing his model. And he sees that, Gak, uh, that Mosca has collapsed and died. And what does Gak do? Because he's so infatuated with his hair. Because Mosca has a nice head of hair. He scalps that man and puts it in his locker at work. Mm -hmm. The end. So that's it. But all of that happens at the very end. So we spend 90 minutes just following people around, talking about mm -hmm. a lot of things. A lot, a lot of things that, in, <clears throat> excuse me, in retrospect, uh, work thematically, as I said, with the film is the title Medusa Deluxe. So we're talking about Medusa who would snake hair. If you looked at it, you turned to stone. And all of these people, you know, emotionally are kind of stone-hearted. Is how I agree. Real. And then there's this whole thing about Gak it being bald and he had felt invisible in this, you know, sea of people obsessed with hair. Uh, I think there's a really interesting scene uh, where Cleve, played by Claire Perkins, who's described as volatile, which I would agree with based on her behavior. She's still continuing to do her model's hair, which is this complex... Uh, it, it's inspired by, I think she referenced the 1700 shipwreck or something. But I don't know if that's another Greek reference to um, Charon, who escorted the souls across the river Styx, you know, in Greek mythology, because she sets herself on fire and that boat falls to pieces. And it, I don't know if that's signifying like this purgatory that we're stuck in. Let me go through my notes. I was conf like, for almost all of the running time, I felt like I didn't know who I was supposed to paint be paying attention to i think the filmmaker trying to because you had mur referenced murder on the orient express and that you know agatha christie not all of her books but focused but most of them focused on one or two characters miss marple or hercule poirot and this notion of the detective tying everything together um and he wants to avoid doing that and i understand that but at the same time we don't like or focus on anybody right um when we meet Gak, the security guard, it's pretty early on, and immediately he's suspicious. So immediately I'm like, oh, he killed the guy. Which, ultimately, he is responsible for the scalping, just not the actual death. The character of Angel... Mm -hmm. Luke Pasquale. I don't know how I want to describe him, because I'm, I, I want to say that he's too much, but it's not because he's like flamboyantly gay. It just feels like... It's almost like he's in a different movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I like he's in some soap opera. Yes, it, it's the act, it's very performative in a way that I don't know if it's supposed to mean something about his character because I actually didn't think how he responds to knowing his partner has died makes sense either. No, because he makes it more about like because Renee 
the one sort of like lead contestant is the one who tells on Hull that his partner's dead. Well, well, Renee organizes the show. And then we find out that Renee and Mosca, the dead guy, had a fling at one point. Mm -hmm. So Renee, so on Hull makes it more about like, he's jealous and how could you be telling me this? All the while, I'll never, like your partner is dead over there somewhere. Don't you want to get up and go over there? And there's a baby in the back of the car that you have with him. Uh, also, what I also didn't like about the scene is that I see this resistance, I think from Robbie Ryan, the cinematographer, because we keep looping around the car and the conversation as the way to keep some kind of energy Interest, going. Yeah. Uh, and, and to me was one of several moments where it's like, we're, we are watching so many people walk back and forth, up and down stairways, that gets really repetitive and boring. And that's why this medium, uh, I think that's why we usually use cutting. So the scene when uh, the one black lady who's doing the model, what's her character's Cleave. name? Cleave. Cleave. So the, the model who has like the updo with the ship on top, she finishes her model and the model says, well, can I take a smoke break? So Cleave is like, yeah, go on, be careful. Don't hit the door uh, well or door jam, whatever you call it. So we see her go on a long walk and it's actually beautifully shot because the hair, the boat like uh, glows, like it's gl like neon blue. It's almost like her hair is like the crack in eating the ship. It, it looks beautiful and we see her walking and there is some tension because I'm like, oh my God, if she messes up her hair, I would be so upset. And then she lights up that cigarette and her hair bursts into flames. And then all of a sudden there's Patrizio, that drug dealer there with a fire extinguisher mm -hmm. to put her out. And then we see him carry her all the way down to the paramedic. I, while it was beautifully shot, I just felt like, oh, because we're doing this single shot thing, we're spending a lot of time doing things that really, what was the purpose? <laughs> it, well, it lends a sense of banality to it. Because if you think of something like Sakharov's Russian Ark or... You know, I, I'd even make an argument for Sebastian Shipper's Victoria from 2015 as a like wonderfully shot genre one shot sequence. But to me, this felt like that movie Silent House, which was Uruguayan and had a, a remake with Elizabeth Olsen also in one shot where it's like this would be so much more interesting if we weren't stuck to uh, this this choice. So it's at the hour 20 minute mark that we see the, the story then focuses on Angel and we see him walking like through the back. Cause at this point we still have not seen like where this contest is being held. And then all of a sudden he walks into an auditorium and we see all of the contestants and models, but they look different. And then we see a gospel choir singing, which I thought was so funny because the audio was great, but the, those poor gospel, like the members of that choir, they look so, uh, <laughs> Like, they weren't sure where they were. Sure, sure. <laughs> but then they start singing, and then it's clear that we have fast-forwarded to the next competition, mm -hmm. which I'm assuming was like they had postponed the one we started with. So now we see everyone who's come back. And they talk about a memorial from Mosca. Yeah. And, and Cleve, who I thought was funny, because her wig... <laughs> And maybe, well, when we see her fast forward, she has on a cuter outfit, but it looked like how in Dreamgirls, when they turned their wigs backwards. It sure did, yeah. <laughs> That's how she mm -hmm. looked. Um, but we, the choir was brought in, is it Divine, who's the Christian character, who Cleve tells several times, like, you're just no good, you're basic. <laughs> like, okay, I'm just so confused with the themes, because it's, it's very obvious that there's a lot of symbolism around hair and coveting hair and how hair can provide for people, how hair is not only um, sort of a representation of who we are, like as a person who doesn't do hair, it's like your hair is your, your crown, but then if, if that's your profession, then it means so much more to you, right? Mm -hmm. So I get all the, well, like that these are symbols. I just don't know how they are supposed to come together to tell a story. Like, I'm not quite sure what I was supposed to get from this story. Well, I don't know. So Divine is bringing in, she, she says something about this baby, like you need to cut off uh, a lock of his hair and put it in the Bible and that will preserve, bless, him, bless him in God's grace or something. And, you know, maybe that's why Mosca got scalped because nobody had done that for him. Uh, with, I, I guess is interesting. Um, but then, you know, if you think biblically of Samson and Delilah about how Samson loses all his power because uh, his, his hair is cut. And I, I don't know. Again, to me, those are the most interesting elements of it. I just don't know that they really come, they, they tie together at all. Oh, the reference that this should have been, um, the pull quote somebody should have put on this poster is this is like Altman. This is like health meets the player, maybe. 
In, there in, is a post credit yeah. scene where now we see all of the people we saw in the film. Now they're just doing a dance sequence, which reminded me of like the end of the first Mamma Mia movie. Um, and that was the most energy we see in the film. And even that felt, I mean, there's, there's definitely a style to this film that it's kind of flat, but there's no humor to me. It needed, it, it needed more swagger considering this, this community of people that we're in. Okay. I thought the better story would have been because the most interesting part is Gak and this man who says that I've never had anyone sort of desire me in the way that Mosca did, which Gak is a handsome guy. Mm -hmm. So I think he's just really thinking like maybe because he's bald, no one will like him. And then he covets Mosca because Mosca has what we're told is a beautiful head of hair. We see him briefly. Um, but I didn't think he was like the most attractive guy. So I think that combination felt a little odd, but whatever. I think the more interesting story would have been that we see initially like Gak kill Mosca or maybe the figure of someone killing Mosca. And then we spend the film trying to, to decide who did it. But I, I really would have liked the feeling of thinking this were a gay panic situation. And then ultimately we find out that, no, this person's obsessed. Mm -hmm. But then I think we needed more about the obsession. And it's like the fan starring Lauren Bacall. <laughs> Hearts Not Diamonds. <laughs> yeah. For people who don't know that reference, go on, or you're on YouTube, uh, look up Lauren Bacall, Hearts Not Diamonds, and hear her sing this power ballad. Oh, it's not her shining hour, but it is fun. It's fun. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I... There's a lot that I think is interesting in this film, and I would watch this person's next film, but yeah. this just did not give me what I needed. For sure. I, I think it's trying to do too much, and it's squandering its most interesting elements, really. Um, Timba, who is the woman that is, the character that's on the poster, uh, who's the one whose hair was being done when Mosca collapsed, she is telling the other models uh, about the hair, he was apparently rambling on about some kind of design, which means come together as one. Hmm. Yeah. Like, like a, a, it was like inspired by some tribe in Ghana, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, I, it's like my mind remembers or is drawn to all of those interesting kind of snippets that seem to fall by the wayside by the time we get to the end. Uh, this does feel inspired, which I always appreciate. So, uh, like, like again, I, I feel bad that I didn't like this movie because I can see that there was a lot of thought put into it. Sure, yeah, I agree. And I, I can also understand some enthusiasm for it because we don't see a lot of people, especially right out the gate, trying to make these kind of stylistic choices. So, but I regretfully didn't like the film. What would you give it? Two. I would give it two out of five as well. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button, listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>